Hello all, this is Tim Donahue from DuraSpace, and this is an early preview of some of the DSpace 7 functionality as of June 2018. I'm recording this just after the Open Repositories conference um, that took place in Montana, and I've got some links up here from some of the presentations that give you more information about DSpace 7 and some of the uh, deeper dives into the DSpace 7 REST API or Angular user interface that were presented at Open Repositories. So I'd encourage you to also take a look at those slide decks for a lot more information about DSpace 7, including roadmap and timeline and all that sort of stuff. Uh, this particular video is really just about providing an early demo, which I uh, gave at Open Repositories as well as part of this DSpace 7 update talk. So this allows you to get a sense of where the project currently sits. So I'm going to move this out of the way now. One thing to note here before I get started is I'm using a public demo repository. The user interface, the Angular user interface, is hosted at atmire.com, while the back end, the REST API, is actually hosted at forscience.it. So these two um, interface, well the interface and the back end are uh, not on the same server obviously and they're quite distant in terms of location so this gives you a good sense of how DSpace can actually support installing the user interface and the REST API separately. Before we get into the Angular user interface demo which will be the majority of this video I did want to touch briefly on the fact that the REST API is now completely redesigned and provides a very human understandable experience so what you're seeing here on this tab is actually a third-party tool called the HAL browser. Our new REST API speaks the HAL format, so this HAL browser understands the HAL format, and it's provided as sort of a human interface to the REST API. If you look through this a little bit, you can see there's various links that provide uh, every single endpoint that is currently available within the DSpace 7 REST API, and you can click on one of the green arrows next to that endpoint so we could look at the items endpoint to get a sense of how that endpoint responds. And this makes a live request back and returns back a page, uh, the first page of items within this repository. So you can see we have a total of 198 items, items within this backend. Uh, 20 are being shown per page and there's a total of 10 pages overall. And you can actually take a look at one of these individual items by just clicking on the item link and you can get the sense of what the title is, what the authors are, the handle, all that metadata that is in the back end is immediately browsable and usable within this REST API. So we're really quite excited about the fact that this new REST API is self-documenting and self-describable and I'd encourage you to go and play with this new demo REST API to get a sense of how you could build new tools against this. Uh, but I'm not going to demo this anymore at this point in time. As I had mentioned at the beginning here, there is a much deeper dive into the REST API, including examples and exercises for how to interact with it that we presented at the Open Repositories conference. So I'd encourage you to go back and grab that link and take a look at those exercises if you'd like to dig a little bit deeper on the REST API. So now I'm going to jump back over to the Angular user interface. One thing to note before we get started into the demo is this very much is a basic Bootstrap 4 theme. So we did that very purposefully with DSpace 7 as, boots, as providing a basic Bootstrap out of the box theme will allow you to apply Bootstrap styles to your DSpace 7 institutional repository at your local institution. Um, that'll provide a lot more flexibility and the ability to theme your DSpace 7 instance. I do also want to note though that we do not currently have a user interface designer on staff with the DSpace 7 group, well a volunteer, <laughs> not really on staff. Um, but if you know of anybody who's interested in helping us do design work with the DSpace 7 user interface, I'd appreciate reaching out to me, let me know, and we can get them involved within the DSpace 7 project and see how we can start to um, even provide a different user experience. You'll already see a very new user experience in a lot of these screens during this demo. But I think there are opportunities where a professional designer could really help us uh, even make it better. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get into the demo portion now. So as you can see on the home page here, we have our usual list of communities. We can browse down to collections and down even to individual items within a collection. 
and see our usual thumbnail and, and item view page along the way. None of that is super flashy, but it's a little bit of a newer theme to uh, the DSpace 7 user interface. But if we go back to our home page, I want to show off some of the newer features or some of the things that look a little bit different than they may look in DSpace 6 and below. So our search box here, let's go ahead and type in a search for standards and hit our search button. And you'll see we have a search results coming back dynamically. Again, this is all JavaScript based, so the, the page immediately loaded with no results and then pulled in the results dynamically from the REST API. On the left hand side here, you can see our usual sort of filters. And again, this is configurable in the very same way that you can configure things with DSpace 6 and below. But you can pull any of these open and get a sense of how many um, authors are available to filter from, subjects you can filter from. And so we can actually click on one of these and filter our results list here dynamically based on uh, the subject metadata standards or whatever other subject you may have here. Obviously, clicking on one of these items here will bring us to the item page, which I already showed along the way. But another cool feature within the new uh, DSpace 7 search interface is the ability to see things in a grid view. So this is very useful for content that is more visual in nature. So if you have content that has a lot of thumbnails, whether it's images or even video thumbnails or just even item uh, PDF thumbnails, this provides a different way to interact with these search results. So it's the same results being shown. You can visualize the thumbnails. We also have this brand new way of actually being able to fit things within a, a sort of panel here and it fades out the text as we get to the edge of the panel. If we want to be able to see the full text that's available within this item, I can click on the panel. So if I click on the panel, we can see it all expand down. It can get the full abstract, the full list of authors, and the full title along the way as well to allow you to quickly find the specific item you're looking for in your search results. So that's all I'm going to show here on the search right now. Uh, but you'll see this pop up again as we dig into the submission and workflow functionality, which we'll so show off next. So I'm going to go back to the home page here just to grab my user login information uh, for the next portion of the demo. So first we're going to log in as the submitter and see how the submission process works. I can log in either by pulling down the login drop down over here in the upper right or I can even click directly on the My DSpace tab here, which of course is, requires authentication. So if I click on My DSpace, we'll be prompted for our login information. We can enter that in and go ahead and log in. And that'll send us directly to the My DSpace page since it knows that's what I was looking for. Again, as you can see here, the same search options are available within the My DSpace page. Uh, the ability to search may not be so useful if you only have a couple items here listed, but it's very useful if you have librarians on staff that may be depositing hundreds of items on behalf of faculty or uh, students that may be depositing their theses or dissertations within your repository. Um, this allows you to quickly find old submissions, things that may already be archived, or also find things within the lists of stuff that may be under review or stuff you're working on. You can also do the same sort of filter. So you can filter by status here, which is useful to allow you to filter by things that are under review in the workflow process or things that you're still working on in your workspace. So you can immediately filter your list of results um, down to, to what you need to find. Another thing you'll notice right away is that we have a drag and drop area or a browse area that allows you to immediately start off a new submission by just dragging and dropping content into this area. And that's what we're going to show off next here. So let me pull up a window here where I've got a couple uh, uh, test files. We're going to start with a PDF. There's also a BibTeX file, which I'm going to show off here a little bit later to show that we can drag and drop some BibTeX and other sort of bibliographic formats. But we've got a PDF here that I've downloaded from PubMed Central. It's a normal publisher PDF, as you can see from Nature Communications. It's got a splash page that gives the normal information from the publisher. I'm going to close that out. And so we'll go ahead and drag and drop this over, which will automatically upload this PDF and uh, start off a brand new workspace item behind the scenes. And we get a little notification here that it's done, and we can click right into that workspace item. It's worth noting that 
we've got a notification system within the DSpace 7 user interface. So you'll see these notifications little by little as we go through this process. Um, they'll pop up in the upper right. So let's go ahead and click here to get into our workspace item. So now we're into the submission process and look at that. We've got authors already pulled out of our PDF. We've got a title pulled out of our PDF. The date of issue has automatically been populated as well. And we've got a full abstract that has been automatically pulled out of that first page of the PDF. This is a brand new feature with DSpace 7. So it's using a third party library called the Grobid library, G-R-O-B-I-D. If you Google it, it's such a unique term that you'll come to it right away. Essentially, that library understands the structure of PDFs, especially sort of scholarly PDFs, and is able to, to analyze uh, the first page of the PDF to extract things like authors, titles, abstracts, uh, date published, sometimes even identifiers out of that first page of PDF of the PDF. It's not always 100% accurate, but we've found that it's usually quite accurate for, for most publisher PDFs or anything that has sort of that, that first splash page. Um, so we hope that this will be a brand new way to be able to really simplify your deposit process into DSpace, uh, both for librarians as well as for individual faculty or students um, at your institutions. Another thing to note from the very beginning here is you'll notice that the entire submission process is all contained on one page. There's no more paging uh, between different pages in order to complete your entire submission. But it's driven by the same sort of configurability that you have in DSpace 6 and below. So if we close these or collapse these panels here, you'll see that instead of pages, we have a series of panels. And these panels will look very familiar to, to you if you're familiar with the out-of-the-box DSpace submission process. So normally we have two describe steps. We've got an upload file step um, and a deposit license. That's kind of the basic uh, workflow of depositing an item within DSpace 6 and below. And this is driven in very much the same fashion. We've got configuration files that are similar in nature to DSpace 6. There's a little bit of uh, new modifications to those configuration files, those XML config files for DSpace 7 to support some new functionality, which you're going to kind of see during this demo. But for the most part, it's very similar to DSpace 6, and we expect the transition of your old DSpace 6 configuration files to DSpace 7 to be very seamless because there's very little change. It's mostly addition to new functionality there. So let's take a look over here on the right hand side as well. You can see there's some status icons with each of these panels. The green check boxes signify that these panels are considered uh, basically complete. Uh, everything required in those panels has already been filled out. So you could submit those panels as is. But this last panel you see has a little exclamation point that's in yellow. And that lets us know that that panel is not yet complete. And because that's not yet complete, we cannot deposit this item. The, the deposit button down here is disabled. I can only save it for later or just save the current progress as we go. It's worth noting that the progress of your submission is saved automatically. As we're going through this demo, you're likely to see uh, some more uh, status boxes pop up in the upper right here as we go. And that's a point where the submission process was automatically saved back via the REST API just to ensure that things are kept back there. Even if you were to leave your window open and walk away from your computer, it will save automatically. So let's open up a couple of these panels again to describe them a little bit more. So this first panel is, has our usual author process. Uh, with these authors, as you might guess, you can remove an author by clicking on the X. You can also reorder them by simply dragging and dropping them within the author list. So if the author list was not in the correct order, you can order them properly. And of course, DSpace keeps the author ordering as it is set within the submission process. So I'm going to go ahead and pull it back to the correct order. You can add additional authors by pulling down this little tiny panel here uh, for authors. And you can see we can add a brand new author name in here. You can also associate an affiliation with the author, which basically links up um, an affili a affiliation metadata field with that author metadata field. But I'm not going to fill that out for now. I'll just leave it as is. We've got our 
little asterisks here to designate which fields are required. So in this submission process that we're currently filling out, authors are required, titles are required, and date of issue is required. And we have our other various fields that normally come within the DSpace submission process and the ability to add multiple where that's available as well as delete entries along the way. So up oh, and here's an example of it auto saving behind the scenes here letting us know there are some incomplete se sections but it has saved our current status. Keywords are very similar to author so we can add keywords just by typing in one or more words and hitting enter. So we can also use phrases so we can say this is a test and hit enter. Um, so those are also valid as keywords. They can be reordered just like authors, so we can reorder them in whatever order we want. Um, the abstract was automatically pulled out as we saw. Uh, the rest of the fields are pretty straightforward here. And our upload file panel, we can see our PDF has been uploaded and it's already been assigned an internal identifier here within the system. And in our deposit, license. As always in the DSpace submission process, the deposit license is required, so we must accept the license before we go, go forward here. As soon as I click on accepting the license, however, you'll see the panel has a green check mark now, and our deposit bo button at the bottom has now been enabled. So I can actually complete our deposit process because all of our panels have those green check marks along the way. One other thing I do want to note before we actually deposit this item is the collection up here can be changed in the middle of the submission process. That's another new feature within DSpace 7. So by default we're, d we're submitting into this collection but I can change our collection to a different one that I have the option to submit to whatever I have the rights to submit to. So I'm going to change the collection here. Behind the scenes that sent a request to our REST API and actually moved this particular workspace item from one collection to another. So it's got a brand new parent collection at this point in time. And we're going to go ahead and deposit this now. We'll go ahead and click on the deposit button, which saves our deposit and kicks off any workflows that may be associated with the particular collection. In this case, there was a workflow associated with the collection that I submitted into. So we see our new item is at the bottom here. You can see it's been moved into the under review status. And now we're actually going to log out here and jump over as the reviewer or validator and see what they see as part of this new submission process. So let's log out our submitter. We'll log in as our validator here. This is the account that can review in that collection. We'll type in the password here. Um, and we'll go over to our MyDSpace page for the validator account. As you can see, this validator is currently working on two items. Well, it's got one that they've claimed already. The brand new item that it, we've just submitted is currently in the task pool, so it needs to be claimed by someone who has, who has rights to, to review in that collection. So I can go ahead and claim that particular item. And the page refreshes, and we can see now we have the option to either re approve, reject, or edit the metadata based on our rights within that particular collection. Again, this is all driven by the same sort of workflow that has been available in DSpace 6 and below. We're using the new configurable workflow system behind the scenes here, um, and it has the same default options that normally come uh, with DSpace out of the box. As you can see also, we do have these pop-ups that provide some help information along the way to allow us to understand what each of these options are during the review process, and we can return it to the pool as well. A new option that you may already have been wondering about is this little email icon along the way here. If you looked closely as I was submitting things, that email icon appeared on the submitter side. It also appears on the validator side. And as you might guess, this is a way to allow communication to go, a two-way communication to, be, to happen between the reviewer and the actual submitter. And this does generate emails between these two users of the system. It also records all the information within DSpace itself. So let's go ahead and take a look at this and demo how this works. So as this is a new submission, we don't have any, any messages here yet, but let's go ahead and thank the submitter. So 
So we can type in our subject and our main text of the email. If we send this off, this has generated an email to the, to the original submitter. It has also tracked this message in DSpace itself. And the message is actually stored in a brand new bundle uh, within the item, uh, which allows us to keep these messages as part of the provenance. It allows you to understand how the review process took place for this item, um, and even how uh, who, who approved it, who rejected it, any comments that were added as part of the rejection process. Those are all stored as part of this new messages option within the workflow process. So go ahead and exit out of this. If we log back in now as the submitter real quick, we'll be able to see those same sort of communications within our submission process. So let's log in and go back to our MyDSpace page and look at that particular item. So we can see we're under review. We have a little new notification that there's a new message here uh, from our reviewer. And we can see the same message that we just entered in here. And of course, the submitter can respond back through this entire process. Um, I did mention this briefly as well. If the actual item is either accepted or rejected, that also does create a message in the same bundle. So you're able to actually now track uh, those, those messages that have gone back and forth between the reviewer and the submitter, just in case you need to go back and review those later on. So that's the basics of the submission and the workflow process. I do want to show off one other uh, cool feature in terms of the submission. I noted that we can drag and drop PDFs and have text extracted. We can also drag and drop many bibliographic formats. So I've pulled down a BibTeX file, again, from the Europe PubMed Central. If I pull in that BibTeX file, it uploads in the same way. We get our workspace item created. And if we click and look at that new workspace item, we'll see it's pulled authors out of the BibTeX file and title information as well as the date of issue um, and any other metadata fields that may have been in the BibTeX file. In this case, it doesn't look like any were there. Uh, the BibTeX file itself is also attached, but obviously you'd be recommended to upload any additional files that may relate to this. But this this on the back end is using functionality that already exists in DSpace 6 and the JSP UI. It's using the BTE uh, library that comes out of the box in DSpace 6 and below um, in many versions. And that library uh, is a bibliographic transformation engine that, that understands various bibliographic formats, formats like EndNote, BibTeX, RAS, and even things like uh, comma-separated values files, and is able to extract some basic metadata out of those bibliographic formats. So this is another way to immediately jump right into the submission process without having to do a lot of manual entry. And I believe that is it for my demo. At this point in time, as you can see, we're mostly uh, have the browse process, search process, and submission workflow process complete. There's still plenty left to do, and we'll have plenty more demos coming forward uh, in the future with DSpace 7 as we go. Um, if you would like more information, I'll again share these links, uh, the roadmap, as well as the status document in terms of features that are still coming in DSpace 7 around administrative functionality, things of that nature. That's all in this presentation from Open Repositories, which I'd recommend you going and viewing. Uh, we also do have several developer sprints coming up. The roadmap is looking good for DSpace 7, but the more developers we get involved, the more quickly we can get DSpace 7 out the door for everybody to start installing and start playing with. So if you're interested, if you're a developer at, or know of developers at your institutions who might be willing to take part in a community sprint, we do have a wiki page with upcoming sprint schedules. The next one is coming up in mid-July. And we do provide sprint coaches during the sprint process. So our last sprint in May, we had several uh, participants who are brand new to, to DSpace 7 and a few that had never even submitted a pull request or code fix to DSpace ever. And we used our sprint coaches to allow them to get familiar with GitHub, get familiar with the the uh, contribution process back to DSpace, and also just get familiar with the DSpace 7 code base. And we found it to be very useful to just kind of helping people get up to speed with DSpace 7, as well as providing some immediate bug fixes and small features into the DSpace 7 code base and allow us to sort of move things along more rapidly. 
So with that, I'll go ahead and end this video. We'd love to hear your feedback, of course, on mailing lists or in Slack, and definitely expect more videos like this one as we get further along and have more features to show off to you. Thank you very much. Bye.